Good morning, noobs. I'm here with Matthew Green, who is just off of the back of the SoCal Open, which if you've been following 40K News right now, was a little bit of an upstart at that final uh, matchup. Luckily, Matthew wasn't there, didn't get tabled turn one um, of the, the finals, and has offered to go ahead and talk to me about uh, his matchups and his list and where you might take Grey Knights in the future. I just want to remind all the new listeners out there down in the description below. I always have chapters. So if you don't want to watch this whole two hour interview, you, you can jump around to whatever topic you think uh, interests you the most and always don't forget to like and comment and subscribe i know you we're all tired of hearing that but it does help uh promote these videos and get more eyes on them so with that we're gonna go straight into talking to matthew here um hey man thanks a lot for uh waking up early uh finally i got to talk to a guest who's in my own time zone so Perfect. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, how do you? How long have you been playing? Uh, and why did you pick Grey Knights? So originally, I started in third edition when I was very young, and it was like the Space Marine and Orc box set with the cardboard dreadnought. Um, so I started with Orcs, and I kind of just like little kid plays. Like you don't really understand what's going on, and my dad did like a bunch of the painting. Um, so I kept playing that way for maybe a few years and then stopped with because I had school and like university and stuff. And then I really got back into it probably at the start of seventh with Tyranids because they were really cool at the time. Ooh, nice. um, but I was just running like the cheesy like seven flying hive tyrant list at the time, which was kind of a lot of fun. And then after I played Tyranids for a bit, I got into Chaos and did a similar thing with like flying demons and summoning shenanigans. Like seventh was a mess. Like just everything, <laughs> get, like two thousand points of free stuff every turn. It was like ridiculous. But uh, then I was yeah playing Chaos. Eighth came out. Uh, sort of did like a thousand. I did like a Jim Vassal style list where it was like a mix of demons and thousand suns like casters with like a little bit of Alpha Legion. Like Dare Dare Dreadnoughts, so I did pretty good with that. And then Psychic Awakenings came out, and then basically Grey Knights became better Thousand Sons, and also Lawrence uh, from Tabletop Titans did really good with Grey Knights. Um, yeah, so I always love to watch him. Um, that's when I started playing. It was like right at the ass end uh, of eighth. So um, yeah, that's pretty much when I picked them up too. Yeah, um, yeah. Basically, after Lawrence wrote the the famous Lawrence list, which was the two Paladin Bombs, yep. six units of strikes, like Librarian uh, Voldus. Basically, that's the list I picked up. Um, got it. Started paying it, and then we just hit lockdown. And then I'm like, lockdown's going to end in like two months, whatever. Going to finish paying this up and then just go play some tournaments. Little did I know, uh, a year and a half later, we're in ninth edition again. And it's like, oh, Grey Knights kind of suck now. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I hope you did some TTS tournaments then. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did a lot of TTS. Um, I think I was like, I did the Tactical Tortoise. And I think in the oh, nice. first season of Tactical Tortoise, I went like 22-1 and one with Grey Knights in pods. Ooh. Be just because they played all that, like the tail end of ITC, they just played that really well, where it's just like hold one, hold two. Kill and kill more, because you never expose anything, so you never give up kill more. <laughs> That's true. Back when uh, Astrolame was out of line of sight shooting. Oh yeah, it was Good it was the best. So yeah, you could just play like a real cagey game and it was probably the best. Um and then yeah, and then just been playing Grey Knights up until now, and now I probably have like six thousand points of Grey Knights fully painted because lockdown is never ending. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I uh quick aside, I have my first tournament here uh the weekend after this coming one and i have been running around i i just painted 20 interceptors and i have two tech marines to go along with a dread knight that's supposed to get here today and then i'll be done 
After that, I'm all set. Uh, I'm ready to which go. Which tournament Another are you going to? Uh, I'm going to the Portland Premier RTT. So okay. Um, I think that's a little bit of a drive uh, for you, but yeah, I'm all the way down in South Cal. So yeah, I'm in Portland, Oregon. So anyway, I'm super stoked. Um, I love talking to all of you more experienced players and getting the idea of what of uh, some things that I might expect. So. Um, I'm actually doing an RTT on Saturday, so cool. we'll see. <laughs> so for somebody who's maybe done a bunch of tournaments, you know, these big GTs, um, was it SoCal a major? It had like 220 players at it, right? Yeah, it was a major. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. And you came in in the top 12. That's amazing, dude. Yeah, I came in 11th. Uh, missed out on the top 8 by like 15 points. But... Man. But still, it is what it is. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm proud. I, I was gonna I did, say, uh, <laughs> yeah, the first SoCal Open I did, um, like two years ago before lockdown, I actually went one in five with a, I had like a Chaos Knight, some Plague Bearers, and like Thousand Suns, but my list was just terrible until like the meta. I just <laughs> gave up Kingslayer every game with my knight, so I just went like one in five with close games, and I played Kenny Boucher though, which was fun. Um, but yeah, but so yeah, I went from a one five to a five one this time. So yeah, that's a a hell of a flip. All right, you want to get in uh, into this list? Yeah. So Wait. I don't think I don't think I'm breaking any uh, any barriers with the list I took. Um, basically, I feel like Grey Knights is like a two sliders. You have a slider for NDKs and a slider for interceptors. And, <laughs> You're going to slide between, like, 3 and 5 NDKs and, like, 20 and 30 Interceptors. And then you've got, like, 400 points to kind of make the list your own. Yep. I think that's a fair assessment, for sure. But, I mean, we're a limited codex, so we don't have a lot of units to choose from. And they chose to make these ones the most efficient. So it's kind of what we have to play until, like, an uh, the MNF comes out, the... To like reduce either terminator points or bump other things up a little bit. Like we'll see. I think yeah. we're gonna dodge this next one, so but um That's a that's a great topic. So alright, new player here. Um so around November we get a a like a, a game wide points uh fact effectively, right? And then Yeah, in December... usually it's like December. Yeah, it usually okay. like December I think it comes out and then but then December in... and January, we have like a big FAQ. All right, that's it. Yeah. Marks. Okay, so that's it. So December, January, got it. Yeah, when and then we'll be getting the sort of like points rebalance, where I suspect we'll see Admech, Orcs, and uh, Jakari going up in points, especially on like boogies, planes, and then probably yeah. Jakari will go up on maybe like, I don't know, witches or just... I don't really know what the problem is. Just, basically, Jakari just have like 10% too much stuff. Maybe like 15% <laughs> too much stuff still for like their points. Um, uh, at least Raiders so, are more expensive, right? <laughs> yeah, they're only a little more expensive. I mean, I Sean and Aiden didn't even take any, but... Um, yeah, well, Venoms are super uh, efficient too, so... Yeah, but luckily I think Grey Knights came out... Because uh, like, GW has like a six-month uh, like turnover pretty much from writing it to printing it to getting it out so i think gray knights will have just missed this one so i expect the other three top factions to get nerfed and then we'll kind of sneak in maybe it's like the top maybe what i kind of suspect um i know at the moment we're sitting at like a 52 55 percent win rate which would be in the golden band um if you know every other army was totally balanced as well yeah, right so. Yeah, I think that's like since the Codex. Because yes, I think last that weekend, is since the Codex. Yeah, so last weekend we sat at a 61% win rate for that weekend, oh, which, really? which was the SoCal one weekend. And then our last four-week win percentage was 60%. So we're oh, actually wow. pretty high. In, we're almost, not quite Jakari 68%, but we're kind of getting there. Or Admech 71%. What was it yep. a weekend or two ago? Maybe it was three weekends ago that they were at like a 71 win rate. Yeah, I think London GT was to blame for that one. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Um, you want to get into this list or start at the the rapiers um, detachment and work our way down, and I'll just ask you questions as we go? Yep. So I kind of took a standard rapiers detachment with Drago. Um, he has had my usual utility spells, so Gate, Sanctuary, and Vortex. And these are like the ones I'll usually want to spend the 3d6 strat on. So kind of gave him those. And then a chaplain, who was my unyielding anvil uh, user and also woods of power and then uh heroism's favor which i probably only used like twice in the whole tournament so okay. but i had the i had like the 15 points and there wasn't anything else to take so i was just like i'll put this on maybe it, come up. if i remember correctly heroism's favor that's the one where you get fight first uh, it's the heroic intervention for any core unit oh, within 12 of the yeah. chaplain. That's so the idea was to have it so an NDK or something could set an objective and if something got too close to try and contest it, you could just heroic in. Nice. Um, um, took a, a strike squad as the troops because it's a patrol. Um, and I was good. running halberds on, I was running basically halberds on everything with a one boarding stay for every five man. So in the ten mans, I was running two uh, staves and then the rest halberds. Oh, so, neat! Even on your your interceptors, huh? Yep. Yeah, so my interceptors. So I had a unit of servitors in there, and then two units of ten interceptors, which were eight halberds, one on the sergeant, and then two warding staves. So basically, when I combat squatted those, I'd have one warding stave in each five man. Right. Um, Just in case I needed the five up in von Strat. Right, I was gonna just ask if you found a lot of value in that versus just like having to roll multiple weapon types and stuff like that when you got into combat. Um, I only used the strat twice all weekend, okay. and it when it comes up, it comes up. But to be honest, it's still flat two damage, and the minus one usually is an issue. But a lot of the time, he is the first guy I pull from each unit. So if some if I, if I take some fire, he'll just be picked up first, and I'll just keep the halberds. Yeah, gotcha. sure. Maybe it's worth just going into another halberd, but <laughs> I I didn't I didn't hate having it. Like it didn't. I don't think like in any of the combats, it it made the difference. Those halberds sure are like iconic. I wish there was a halberd option for for the dread knights. I think that oh, yeah, would be, be dope. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really sick. But yeah, I just think so. But the maths between halberds and swords is super close on like most targets. The only thing where swords really edge out is on the. It, ironically, it's the mirror. So it just kills three up <laughs> armor saved marines better than yeah. any other weapon. Because yep. it's strength five minus three. But uh, everything else I feel like the halberd's better into. There's a lot of T3 in the top armies. Uh, the Strength six is super relevant against buggies because you're winning on fours instead of fives. Um, yeah, but yeah it's so big into like laser chickens too because their strength or their toughness six as well. I, I yeah, I think the laser halberds chickens, are in a great spot. Yeah, raiders, basically everything. Um, <laughs> even like venoms, you wound them on threes instead of fours. So yeah. speaking of halberds, the meta. You know, they're, they'll they'll be better, or the mirror, they'll be better into someone else's uh, Dread Knights as well, because of the that's same true. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the other thing about the Halberds is that the minus two usually takes you to the invuln of, like, any kill unit you're going to go into. So, I don't think... For me, the Halberds are, like, the best, but there's arguments for you, though. Yeah. Anyway, so that was my Reaper's Patrol. Yep, sure was. And then I made the interesting decision of going Prezient instead of Swordbearers in my, like, NDK part of the list. Um, and that's mostly because, like, through playtesting the army, I found I never used the plus one to hit strat. Two CP was too expensive, like, yeah. all the time. Especially when you're already given plus one with a tech marine, you're re-rolling ones with everything, you have Drago re-rolls. So, the plus one to hit strat never came up. The plus one to wound is good, but it's 12 inch range and it's on a seven. So you still only have a 56% chance of it going off on yeah. just like a straight roll. And the way I play is similar to Nick, where I'm just going to throw out one unit onto an objective to get like strangle and do purifying ritual. If I was going to take 
sword bearers, I'd have to throw out a second unit to try and basically get the power off in range. So I was like, sword bearers isn't great, and Prescient is just amazing on the Grandmaster. It's just rerolling ones to hit to wound, and oh yeah, it's just it's so good. He hits on twos, um, and then he just becomes super reliable. So in that, I had a spearhead. So it was a tech marine. He had uh, foretelling, uh, which is the redeploy. Yeah, that's also, so amazing. He also had my divination warlord trait, which is the CP regen, which is like three CP average per game regen. So it kind of just pays for the detachment. Yeah, um, especially when you're only starting with what seven CP? I see. Start, so. Starting with seven, which was it was fine. I never. When you can gain two a turn, it's you kind of just have gas for the whole game. So yeah, that's a I great point. Didn't really miss it. Um, then I took guy my spice was the ten man purifiers, um, which was uh, kind of like split into two halves, which was four side cannons with a warding stave, and then four halberds with a warding stave. So you use them as a purgation squad with a big ass smite. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so the reason the other reason I went for purifiers instead of purgation and like another strike squad, which would have been like ten points cheaper, is because uh, I did want that purifying fire. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, just wanted a smite that's uh, not a smite, so it doesn't like ramp up the smite cost even more. And Good also, point. with so many planes in the meta, you there's a lot of times where they just fly in early, and then you can do your two purifying ritual, uh, two purifying fires. Do your three smites, do your vortex, and that you picked up a plane and a half just through the smite damage, which is pretty great. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And the side cannons in there were kind of my Drago target early game for the whole time because if they move or gate, they're going to be hitting on fours, but then you just counteract that with full rerolls, so they're mm -hmm. hitting like nine out of twelve shots on average. And then it gives my list um, thirty uh, side cannon shots. So really great into speed, uh, speed freaks, because uh, I'm going to use the one CP strat to make their gun strength eight minus two Absolutely. every time, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, so that was um, my purifiers, and I just had three Nemesis Dread Knights bring me to four total, and these guys were just bare bones, pretty much. They were. No teleporter, no sword. They were just fists and guns. And... Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, in fact, I've got numerous questions here for you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so I'll go back up to the, 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 the top. I know when the Grey Knights Codex hit, um, everybody was like losing their damned minds about the word of power and uh, wombo combo with rapiers plus one at uh, uh, attack, exploding sixes, and then words of power. Did you get that off frequently? Um, so basically, I put it in the list. It's basically a del if I wanted to delete something in a turn, if I needed to kill 10 Deathwing Terminators or kill a block of. Sakari Rangers or whatever, I could just go. I'm gonna spend the two CP, give the words of power, run okay. five guys in, and just trade up, uh, super high. Gotcha. Um, so it did come up a few times. Um, I used it against a Sakari, uh, a Ranger block. Um, even into like speed freaks, it's kind of good just with that double mortal wounds and just doing more one damage. Um, saves. <laughs> But then the chaplain's other big use in the list is uh, the leadership nine aura, which people don't really think about. But then when you're combat squatting interceptors, they only have leadership seven without the sergeant. Yeah. So you lose you lose two guys, and then suddenly you have to make morale, and then on a six you lose could lose another guy, and that came up like a bunch of times. Just having that leadership nine was great hmm. for staying on objectives. And the other thing is is a niche use into Jakari where. Um, they charge in with their incubi, and then instead of making you fight last on a seven, they're doing it on a nine. So, again, yeah. it's just like a That's he neat. has an like extra utility outside of that. That's a uh, that is a little tech choice that I've never heard anybody mention. That's really neat. I um I forget that they have that or all the time, but I run chaplains in my death watch, and my death watch veterans have leadership uh, nine with their sergeants anyway. 
So yeah. it's a little different. Purify, yeah, Purify is the only guy who's really shipped nine in, yeah. in my is, list. So Which is a little sad, honestly. Like you, you would yeah. think Grey Knights would have one more le- one more leadership pip, but uh I don't wanna get into that right now. Um yeah. Drago, um I know when lists came or the codex came out, everybody was running him. Do you find him completely integral and you'll never replace him or are you kind of like looking at that 180 points and wondering if you can't drop him down to like a librarian and then bring more servitors for action monkeys or something so with drago um for me he was great because like i said with the purifiers once i can use the full rerolls on the heavy weapon half gate them out into get a good line on something and then He's providing value there. Then after that, he's going to give full rerolls to one NDK, and then you know, uh, just reroll ones for everything else. Yeah. Well, my Grandmaster can be out on the board, so he's kind of like giving my stuff reroll ones in the back. Um, but I am looking at lists without like uh, this RTT on Saturday. I've currently dropped him uh, and the Chaplain, and just Ooh. going for like the Mortal Wound uh, Librarian plus like another. GM DK. Silver and four Dread Knights, but two are gonna be the GMs and just two regular. But yeah. I think he he was good this weekend. Casting two is big. It, and that is a great point, yeah. If you really casting, need to, you can get all three off with uh the one CP strat. Yeah, and the thing is he is like a mid game like beat stick. Like you do need to turns one and two he doesn't do a whole lot, but when the <laughs> enemy sort of like lost some of its like heavier firepower he can kind of just run out there and oh yeah they have they have the choice of shooting at him where he's got his three up in vuln or he's a one up in cover with his you know terminator armor and he's got seven wounds and if he can distract from like an ndk or whatever taking shots then it's kind of worth it so oh yeah man his and his attack profile is bonkers like on the charge he's got like what seven a tank strength Eight minus four three damage. Like, yeah, um, he he has the, basically the perfect profile to go into speed war as well at that strength eight minus four flat three. So he can kind of just chop buggies up as well. So he, <laughs> for me, he's good. Um, but I can see why people drop him because like he can kind of just be 180 points. That's just giving out chapter master and doing two casts, which could just be a librarian. Yeah. All right. Um, I love your choice of some servitors. Um, I, I in my eighth edition list, I ran them all the time. Um, they're just gorgeous to sit around and and you know throw up banners or just screen out your backfield or whatever. And no one wants to drop on them because they're a thirty point unit. So if if they kill, you know, if they deep strike in and use a whole unit to kill some servitors, that that feels pretty bad for them <laughs> but also yeah, uh, you don't really care because you're like it was 30 points huh? like whatever yeah so servitors are pretty great um especially with a kind of sit back plan like you said you want to do banners with them and with the like rod maybe i did have two units in but i dropped one for the foretelling of locus like redeploy yeah uh, the only bad thing with servitors is that against the freebooters, I have to reserve. I pretty much reserve them every time uh, for the one CP, just strategic reserve them because I don't want to give up that free plus one to hit. And yeah. If you have them on the board, they're just that's what they're gonna do. Yeah, they're gonna go after him right away. Yeah. Sure. So. Um, and we'll get into some freebooters strategy in a bit. Um. But uh, when when we go over your uh, because you faced freebooters twice, right? Yeah, faced yeah. them twice. Yeah. Uh, all right. Not a whole lot about your interceptors. You already um went over that with me. So divination worked out for you. Then you 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 were were getting lots back. I asked for a personal reason because this list that i'm going to take to the rtt i am going to not take rapiers and instead take uh prescient brethren so um like i said it's like a three cp average a game because it's not a six so chances are you get three times i wouldn't plan around having the two back each turn but with the turns you do it's obviously great yeah normally it's just like 
it makes the detachment it came in for free, so That's for me it was point. good. Yeah. And in the, yeah, it's only a, a thing. Um, like on the tech marine, it's great because you can still give the plus one to hit out because psychic action doesn't cancel anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was good. Nice. Um, how do you how do you use foretelling of locusts? So for me, I can either deploy aggressively. And then if I lose the roll off, I can redeploy or I can do that the other way, right? Where I can deploy defensively. And then if I win, I can like put a bunch of uh, Dread Knights like right on my deployment line. Is that a pretty standard or am I missing some nuance there? So... I didn't take it for a long time. Like I said, I had the X unit of servitors and then playing with it a little bit. Like because so we should talk about FL, the FLG tournament as well because it's like play place terrain. Okay. So that's kind of like a very different mechanic to a lot of other tournaments where you kind of get to set up your half of the battlefield how you want it for the matchup. So playing with the play place terrain and and like how I wanted to deploy, I didn't feel like a lot of games I needed the redeploy because I could already hide everything or basically be in a position I wanted to be in. But I took it anyway, and the two games I used it to, I think I only went first two times, and that's like most <laughs> times I used it. Um, but yeah, so normally it's kind of. I'll always drop my NDKs last because I always want to see where their stuff's going and then I want to mm. counter with where I put place my Dread Knights. Makes sense. Um, so, I guess like that is kind of the way you can, can, can just deploy aggressive or defensively and then flip-flop with how you want to do it, but usually I will... You can kind of bait things out as well. You can, normally, you can some, like, against a more, like, less experienced player, you can kind of drop some drop something, he'll counter-deploy something to have, like, a move and then get line of sight on that thing, and then you can kind of mess him up. <laughs> That's or a you great can, point. <laughs> or the other thing is you kind of deploy heavier on one side and they kind of mirror, and then you can swap over three things to, like, the other side. Um, but usually I used it on, like, one Inceptor unit to, like, put them into a good position to get onto a center objective, and then uh, two NDKs would usually get redeployed as well just to get, like, good line of sights. Gotcha. Um, no questions about the Grandmaster. That's a pretty standard build right there. I love it. Um, yeah. Especially uh, in Prescient, meaning you can always get reroll ones to hit and always get reroll ones to wound. That's... Yeah. I think the only thing I did a little different was I took Hammer of Righteousness on him as his Warlord trait instead of First of the Fray. Mm -hmm. Um... Just because that plus one to wound means that his sweeps are pretty much wounding everything on twos as well. Yeah. And then reroll ones, obviously, from the foretelling strat. So you, you're going to get your 12 hits, your 12 wounds, and it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I've been playing with Demon Slayer and Hammer of Righteousness on my big Grandmaster for the same... I mean, one more attack... And then, yeah, it's great, which yeah. is two more sweeps, so... Yeah, and if I ever do run into a Demon's player, I'm gonna punk a, uh, a Demon Prince in one turn. Because <laughs> you yeah. won't get your invuls. <laughs> yeah. um, cool, so the Purifier Squad, this is a super interesting piece of tech. Um, you don't see it a lot in many lists right now. I actually just interviewed... Uh, David Ozawa, who took first place at the Crucible GT, and he took a big brick of purifiers as well, although he played with them completely differently than the way you did. So he kind of like moved him up the board uh, as a big 10 man supported by an Apothecary and Drago, um, and then using the minus one damage strat and Sanctuary to make them really hard to shift. You combat squatted into two five mans, so you had a effectively a purgation squad with that purifying flame. And then, how did you use the other squad? Um, they were usually just something to sit back and do purifying ritual all the time, and then they'd come out like in 
like turn five or, f or four maybe um it's just like another strike squad kind of melee combat unit but usually they just sit back and just be doing like purifying ritual okay and then getting them into range to do their uh good smite a lot of the time as well yeah like i said against flyers they were amazing um i believe it and it's almost like flyers are a huge part of the meta right now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I fought a lot, and every time I got to pretty much pick one up in every psychic phase. So That's gorgeous. Um, and then the only other question I I really have is, um, so, like, the way I run my Dread Knights right now is with the lot, like, they are, they got everything on them. They got teleporters, they got great swords, um... You went with just two weapon options, the the weapon options, right? Nobody takes in incinerators that I've seen. Yep. Um, but you went with just just fisticuff guys, and um, walk me through that. So I wanted to keep them basically by not taking the sword and the teleporters. You're saving twenty five points a guy over yeah. three guys. It's basically a tech marine for free into the list, or you know, two visions plus some servitors. It's like a lot of points saved, and with how I wanted to use them, they were kind of just um, like gun platforms. And to be honest, with the fists, the strength twelve minus three flat two, yeah, they can they can kind of punch like intercess like marines to death pretty easily. Any like five man unit that touches them, you're gonna punch three to death, and then um so i didn't really yeah. miss having the swords that's a good point actually i like that because yeah, they, they are could... yeah strength eight minus three two damage is a uh a marine killing profile for sure well they're strength 12 because it's times two so oh yeah so yeah they can punch a lot of stuff and the other thing is um you're not really gonna get like they're not gonna touch you with like anything like you're not going to get touched by like 20 guys. So if there's like two guys left or just a couple of guys left, you can always smite the last guys off your <laughs> NDKs. Yeah. And you have gate as well, so you don't really need the teleporter because you're going to shunt your GM turn one probably. And then a lot of times I'll sometimes shunt interceptors if I need to get like rod or... I don't know. I don't feel like shunts like every... Like you're not going to use shunt every turn. It's two CP. So you're going to no. use it once or twice and gate the rest of the time so gotcha. I, di I didn't feel like i needed the teleporters and the swords i didn't really need either yeah it it's kind of like an internal goal of mine to be able to in one in my opponent's turn get my grandmaster with the sigil of exigence actually targeted because once i tell my friends that he'll just leave they never shoot him so i want him to be shot at so he can move and then in, in my turn i gate one and shunt a, a, Another, I just like that's an internal goal of mine is to throw three dread knights like right into my uh, opponent's face, uh, but yeah. it's never happened. Sad pity. Yeah, it can be pretty aggressive, but yeah. Great. So yeah, that was like the main reason, just saving the points basically, and I think okay. Nick does is doing like the same thing. Yeah, I was gonna point that out. Is that Nick Nan Nick Nan ah, Nick Nanavati actually? did that as well at the crucible gt um it was the first time i'd seen lists with with no alternative weapon um sticking the hammer on the normal dread knights is a terrible idea because hitting on four sucks but, yeah unless um, you give him drago rerolls or something then yeah. yeah it's a very feels bad when you hit like two times and yeah <laughs> so um i mean the fist that's a that's a great idea all of my dudes are Magnetized, so if I want to pop their their fists back on there, it's not a big deal. Yep, same with my guys. Um, I was running swords, but like I said, basically when you say saving the seventy five points is kind of big because, like I said, it's almost it's like basically a tech marine or it's two thirds of an interceptor unit. It's like yeah. a lot of stuff. I mean, and then talking about, I mean, going back to exactly what you said, right? Like these are gun platforms. They are really good at shooting. <laughs> You want them yep. to be shooting. Um, getting them into combat is like a um, it's a bonus, but it's not what they're there for. So dropping the expensive combat weapon is not a bad idea. Yeah, and like I said, they don't punch 
terrible. Like, they're still putting out five attacks, you know, hitting yeah. on threes, wounding on twos, pretty much for everything, so... Yeah. Um, I mean, even into, like, Redemptors or, like, Plague Burst Crawlers, they're gonna be wounding on threes with those fists, and that's pretty, yep. pretty legit. Um... So talk to me about secondaries. Obviously, you already mentioned Stranglehold. Um, you said you kind of trade like Nick Nanovati does, where you like move up one unit and you know it's probably going to die and you're just going for the str Stranglehold point. So Purifying Ritual is a fucking no-brainer. It's like one of the best secondaries in the game. Uh, yep. Stranglehold, and then you hold on to the third against your enemy, or, you know, priority targets, which is the best mission of a secondary in the game, or, like, what? Like, grind them down? Uh, usually, Banners of Rod is, like, my third choice. Like, okay. it would normally be Ritual, Strangle, and then Banners of Rod. Very cool. Pretty much, like, my other two choices. Yeah. Uh, grind, uh, obviously, against Freebooters, I'll do... Uh, Big Game Hunter or whatever it's called now. Kill, oh, kill the, boogies. Yeah, the uh, um, yeah, bring bring them down or bring it down yeah. or whatever bring for tanks. Yeah, yeah for, uh, for vehicles. Okay, so so really, your clutch ones are almost always stranglehold and then um, purifying ritual. Ritual. What do you do on what is is it battle lines? Is that the 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 mission four with objective. four objectives? So I actually took Stranglehold on that one as well against Freebooters. Oh, which... you did? Yep. Um, I can get into that when we get to the matchup, but sure. it's basically because of like a FL... Like again, FLG terrain is like a little different because um, they kind of custom keyword a lot of their pieces. Okay. So... Interesting. I and should look that some... up. Yep. And on some of their boards, there is actually still magic boxes, if you remember back to, like, 8th and 7th. So wow. I just started so playing at the ass end of 8th. Like, I think I got in two games on TTS before ninth hit. So, so a magic <laughs> box is, for people who don't know, is essentially a ruin that is breachable, but it has no windows or doors on the bottom floor. So it's like kind of oh. like usually like a bunker or something. So it's something you can enter but not be shot like shot at okay. from like conventional weapons so on the orc tr so there's a train type that is like the orc table and it basically has one of these magic boxes so i placed a magic box onto one of the center objectives because you get to place your terrain so i kind of just hit something in there against freebooters they're mostly trucks and then he couldn't really do anything to that one so i just had to focus on the other objective so okay. that was like specific Specifically because of the train layout yeah. and because of the, the type of opponent, I felt comfortable taking stranglehold on that one. So that's awesome. Like I, um, I've never played with player place terrain. Um, I didn't even know that this tournament ran it. I should look up um some tutorials or something because yeah. like terrain. My first few games of ninth, I was playing against some of my friends that have been playing Warhammer on and off since like yeah third or fourth edition and they would just absolutely batter the crap out of me um and this was like you know this was ninth edition but but it was two eighth edition codexes so you know pr uh. like pretty even steven but uh we learned very quickly we weren't playing with enough terrain yeah like, terrain it, it, is very important yeah and even more so for gray knights because i've always felt like terrain just makes gray knights even better Back in the days of Astral Aim, was like obviously amazing, but now we want to sort of stage behind some L's and then just be within strike range of like them center objectives. Yeah. But but yeah, if you're in like the Calif like California Vegas area, all the frontline gaming tournaments are currently now using the play place. So okay. They did the Las Vegas team tournament, which is play place. So I played there, and then LVO is also going to be uh, player placed. LVO is February this year, right? Uh, January twenty seventh. Oh, okay. Almost February. <laughs> yeah, basically almost February. Gotcha. But yeah, yeah. Maybe next year. Uh, I'll go up in Portland. I I'm only like an hour and a half flight to get to Vegas. Uh, and my older brother lives that lives there anyway. So it's yeah, I'm like a four excuse. hour drive. So that's I'll not bad. Drive. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad at all. Well, that's the list. 
Um, fantastic, cool little tech choices. Um, obviously, you piloted it very well because uh, even though 11th doesn't sound, you know, super flashy, that is 11th place out of 220 or whatever. And uh, some of the names on the top there are uh, pretty frightening. So, <laughs> yeah, there was some. There was definitely some good players. Uh, I'm kind of glad the Elder War guys went there because. <laughs> But we yeah. still had like Sean, um, Sean Naden. Jr. Yeah. yeah, there's like a lot, of, a lot of good guys there. So the tabletop Titan guys were there. So oh, they were cool. Yeah, uh, Brian. Oh, yeah. who won, who won the last SoCal that was open. He was two places above me. He finished at ninth, and then Adrian from there, he finished yeah. just above me as well. I see that now. Yeah, uh, Brian Poland got ninth, and then Adrian Phillips got tenth. I, you know, I. It's funny because I was reading all this and I never even noticed it. And I think it's because when I'm watching Tabletop Titans, I never hear their last name. You know what I mean? Yeah, pretty like, much. Just... Just... <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, it's just like, yeah, you just hear Brian or Adrian. It could be like anyone. Yeah, but, but if you're like listening to a uh, podcast, they're always like Sean Naden, right? Nick Nanavati, yeah. Richard Siegler. It's always their full name. But mm -hmm. but when you look at Ryan, or Brian and Adrian, it's just Brian and it's and it's you know Adrian, right? Yeah, it's like a mom and pop star kind of thing, right? <laughs> like where it's like the your uh, yeah. local. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you want to get into those matchups? Uh, actually, let's let's talk real quick about how was the tournament. Obviously, FLG has been doing this a long time, but like, how was the venue? How was the terrain? Um, you know, how was the food? <laughs> so, venue was pretty great. Um, it was at the Del Mar Fairgrounds, so we we're basically in like a giant hangar kind of thing. So, hmm. got a little warm, but luckily it's kind of getting cooler now. So. It was fine, plenty of space. Um, terrain was great, like FLG have. So their terrain setup is basically there's five different table types. There's like orc table, there's airfield, gothic ruins. Okay. Uh, then two so, others. And basically, so basically they have the, F, the FLG terrain sets I think they sell, and they basically had these five tables repeated one after another. 50 times or whatever, wherever to get to the 220 tables. Gotcha. So when you got to your table, you would have one of these five sets of terrain. Each one is slightly differently um, like tagged, I guess, for the traits. So they had like some weird ones where like a forest, like some forest types were also obscuring as well as dense and light. So you could hide behind a forest and it would be line of sight blocking. Oh. So it's like, Something if you're going to do an FLG event, you need to like just double check all the packet stuff because gotcha. some people get caught out by like what's line side blocking, what's not, what's giving dense, what's giving. There wasn't a lot of dense on all of the tables, which is one of the things, but it was fine. So yeah, every table had the same terrain, so terrain was great. Um, uh, events, all the rounds ran on time pretty much. So, did you find yeah. yourself using a chess clock, or are you an experienced enough player where, like, you just go, 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 go? Uh, I didn't. I think I used it in one game. It was against the Death Guard, but uh, we quickly did not need it. So. Oh, okay. I I bought one. I've never played with one, but uh, it's always interesting to watch like streamed games where. Yeah, they're, I'm generally they're a fast player. It. The first few turns are a little slow, but then you kind of get in the rhythm of. Yeah. Like, especially in, like, turns 3, 4, and 5, where it's kind of like, okay, I know I need to just kill this, move on to this. <laughs> I don't, you don't really need to, like, the damage has already mostly been dealt, and you're kind of just figuring out where you can maximize points here and there, and you just kill, like, the necessary stuff. Um, yeah, I was so, yeah. just going to say that, like, usually after turn 2, half of the shit on the board is dead anyway. <laughs> yeah, we're in a very killy meta at the moment, so yeah. a lot of stuff dies. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you. That's uh, always interesting to hear about how well these uh, these tournaments are actually set up. I know FLG has been doing this a very long time, and obviously they host the the LDO. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, round one was against Thousand Sons. Um, yep. Uh, it was against Edward. Um, 
he was a good opponent. We both got there pretty tired on the first day. <laughs> um, and he was not very happy to be coming up against Grey Knights, which is kind of expected, since there wasn't a lot of Thousand Suns there, and there actually wasn't many Grey Knights. So to get a Thousand Sun Grey Knight matchup first round was kind of unfortunate, but because we kind of have the edge in that matchup. Yeah. And his list was also maybe like 1,400 points of optimized stuff and then like 600 points of kind of like fun stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, what mission was it? Do you remember? Uh, it was Retrieval. Retrieval mission. All right. Yeah, so mission one. Uh, we, play, we played in order because we there was nine rounds total. Uh, six basically to decide the top eight and then the top eight played uh, the last three rounds. So we basically played all nine missions, but the... The day three people got all the good missions, which were like priority uh, sweeping player. Really. <laughs> the so, other one, huh? Another good one. So they got all the good missions. It, is is retrieval that bad? Really? It's Retri six retrieval's not bad. But You've got one in your own spot. I'm, like I'm talking more like vital intel and scouring battle lines. So we had to play all three of those, which are kind of like the worst half of the missions. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, I know you're. You are gonna be hard pressed to find anybody that likes the scouring. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's. Yeah. That one is always a horrific slugfest with uh, that, and then that sh that terrible little squished deployment zone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we played retrieval, and yeah, it was. Um... Well, I went 95 to 57, which kind of says how the game went. Um, but in that one, I took Strangle. I took, I did take Purifying Ritual, even though he had Denies, because he didn't have as many Denies as I had casts. And because you can keep casting on the same objective, even if you fail, I gave him basically the option of trying to counter as many as he can, but then I can still get do it, or he could do Gates or whatever. Yeah. And then I think I took um, Banners. Banners was my third one because it's got two far back. So it was like a guaranteed guaranteed 10 pretty much compared to Rod, which is a possible 12. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an interesting point. So were you using like HQs? No, you can't use HQs to raise banners. I mean, obviously you have one squad of servitors to raise banners with. And yep, then you and then have to... Oh. Just be like a strike squad or something that mm -hmm. would raise the other one. But they can't raise a banner and then all, also do purifying ritual on one turn, right? No. So like yeah. I said, uh, <clears throat> I play like more like the Nick, where it's kind of cagey, so a lot of my stuff's just back anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. I only really push the one unit out, so I have a lot of units kind of just sitting around in, the, in turn one and two that are free to raise banners. That's why gotcha. maybe the servitors get dropped, um, just because they're so bad into the freebooters matchup. Um, but we'll see. They're like they're like useful. I mean, theoretically, depending on and you know how well you do, turn one and two, you don't have to purifying ritual at all. Then no, turn exactly. like turn three, you can get four, and then turn four and five, you can get six, and you've maxed it. So like, yeah, it's <laughs> always know. like a safe one. Or even um, if you just do four for the last three turns, like that's still twelve points. That's significant. Yeah, well, since the average one is like 9 or 10, so you're yeah. still getting higher than average. Exactly. But yeah, so he got first turn, um, and then he took Engage, um, the Thousand Sun Mutate Terrain or whatever, and then I think he also took Banners. Uh, so how, how does the Mutate Terrain one work? Is it basically their version of Purifying Ritual? or It's similar, so they cast it onto an objective and then they get three points but they can only do it once per turn and on once on each objective oh so okay it's it's worse in most regards like it's normally like a nine i guess like if you do it on your two home ones and one middle one you're gonna uh -huh. get nine okay but um so average <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah he basically flew his flies in to get engaged turn one and then i kind of just did the like i said purifying flames Vortex, some smites, dropped one of the Hell Drakes out. Because he had two Hell Drakes, and then he had some, like, uh, spawns on another one. Basically, I just killed what I needed each turn and got Strangle every turn, and then 
towards the end. He'd almost been tabled, so I got like a last couple of banners up. Gotcha. Yeah, ninety-five to fifty-seven is uh pretty legit. So. Yep. So that was like a pretty. It was like a nice war, uh, like wake up game. <laughs> not not too tough. <laughs> gotcha. Um, I mean, how do you feel in general the matchup is between Grey Knights and Thousand Suns? Because as I understand it, and I I still haven't played the new Thousand Suns codex, um, but like we use our psychic phase mainly for buffing. Uh, we can explode out and do a bunch of mortal wounds if we need to, but for the most part, it's like hammer hand and purifying ritual and you know buffs, right? It's not. It's not damage where it seems like theirs is like doom bolt and smites for days and you know yeah um so we kind of have better shooting and better combat and they have a like a slightly better psychic phase but because we have to feel no pain we kind of deal even damage almost mm -hmm. if they're doing like a third more smites we just negate that with the five up so right we kind of just have them beat on like all the fronts like in every phase and we're like just cheaper and more efficient. I do think Thousand Suns have like some good lists. They're just not as straightforward as Grey Knights. So I don't think like gotcha. the best list has been found yet. Yeah, I I, uh, I hear that a lot too. Is that the uh, the skill ceiling for Thousand uh, Suns hasn't been uh, remotely reached yet, which will yep. be interesting to see um, how that. Uh, grows and evolves in the uh, future. I talk a lot to uh, Denith Lianagama, who's a Death Watch player down in uh, Austra uh, Australia, and he does a lot of the, the like uh, the high end team tournaments um, down there. And Liam Liam Hackett uh, has been seeing a lot of crazy uh, success down there with the uh, Thousand Suns. So they're always kind of a boogeyman in the back of my mind, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Hey, I've played Denise a few times, actually, on oh, cool. Tabletop Sim uh, in the Tactical Tortoise. Um, nice. I think, I think I knocked him out of the Season 1 qualifiers. <laughs> <laughs> He's a he, was playing, he was playing, like, some crazy, like, 30 possessed list, and I was playing Grey Knights. So oh, it yeah. Was kind but... of, it was kind of bad, because I was just, like, flat 3, 4 yeah. damage smiting everything, and it was just like, oh. Yeah, that was those were the 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 the, the heydays of the eighth edition codex right into yeah. demons. Yeah, oh yeah. man, no, oh, he's a great guy. I love him. He's uh, uh, he and I talk almost every day. So yeah, but yeah, I think uh, Thousand Suns definitely have room to to rise up, but they're not quite as popular as any of the other, like Grey Knights, for instance, and yeah. their codex is just deeper, like. Grey Knights, I feel, got like solved day one pretty much because we had like two or three like superstar units. Where Thousand Suns are kind of like a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, like I really like the spawns. I think like two units of five spawns is pretty great, just for their points. Um, but yeah, we'll just, see what just, they can do. Just to do stuff on the backfield or <clears throat> well, like these screens for mortal wounds or that. Well, five spawns is 115 points. It's 20 wounds at T5. You can give them the four up in Vaughn. You can give them minus one to be hit. Uh, Thousand Suns have a great strat for them, which is... So they have 2d3 attacks normally. Mm -hmm. Their strat gives them plus one attack. So each one is like five attacks average. And then you get to pick their mutation. So they can have full rerolls to wound, minus four, or they can do like an additional d3 attacks. So oh. usually you're going to do full rerolls to wounds. So then they've got... So 115 points is 25 attacks, hitting on fours or threes if you give them the plus one to hit, and then the full rerolls to wound at minus two flat two. So they're pretty scary for. So they're a strike squad with hammer hand on them with more attacks, more wounds, and more toughness for. Yep. Yeah. For five more points. Yeah. Or one more much. point point per model. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> Cool. Well, while I'm thinking about it, before we get into round two, uh, you kind of brought it up. What do you think, like, you know, our codex, like you said, there's just not, there aren't a ton of options. Um, 
Just because, I mean, our whole army is built out, out, out of, what, three boxes, effectively? <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, we have choices within those boxes, but in this codex, right, with the the efficiency of Strike Squads uh, and the, the Dread Knights, especially the interceptors what would you like to see to bring to, to to like add more variety to gray knight lists um so i'll be honest i definitely preferred eighth edition gray knights to current gray knights because i feel there's a lot more finesse with i would have been happy if our new codex was just the same as eighth but we got the extra wound that would have <laughs> been great <laughs> but um I think like what we really need is just points drops. I don't think anything we have is particularly problematic. Um, maybe Dread Knights could be like ten points extra or like twenty points extra, and like strikes and interceptors could go up a point maybe. But I don't think we have anything that's crazy, like offensive. When you have like eighty point incubi and yeah. you know what, <laughs> eighty point <laughs> rooker trucks or whatnot. So yeah, man. The the ninety point squid buggies and the uh, yeah 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 so I don't think we have like anything it's just mostly the terminators and paladins just need to be cheaper because getting two strikes for every terminator is just like mathematically you're doing less shots you have less wounds yeah you're doing less in combat so that's like the main thing probably just a few units need to be brought down cheaper. And maybe like a couple of strats need to be changed because I feel like uh, the minus one damage being two for a five man, it should be like one and two for like one CP for five and then two CP for ten. Ten or um, yeah. some of the other things. Like it's weird they made Vendreds, um, the not get any Brotherhood stuff. Um, the Honored Knights, yeah. Yeah, so there's like a few weird choices, but. And the but most. The transhuman scaling is like yeah, really also bonkers kind of to me. Yeah, it's... yeah. A one and two sounds fair when in this uh, when uh, what is it? Primaris Marines pay one and two. So. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought is that we would get one and two, but we get two and three instead. So it's like you know, I I I, I was asking David yesterday. I'm like, were you using transhuman on those purifiers? And he sure as hell was. Like he. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> he was doing everything he could to keep them alive and soak up damage, and I guess it worked. So, <laughs> yeah, I used transhuman uh, a few times as well, but I would prefer it to be cheaper. But gotcha. there's like one matchup in specific where it gets used quite frequently. Which one is that? Uh, freebooters. Okay. I was gonna <laughs> get to it. I was gonna get right. to it when I got to the thing, but gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, let's jump into round two then. Uh, Death Guard. Uh, yeah, so this was against Alex, who's from XPZ. So he's like the same team as Logan, who won it. I actually played four XPZ guys over the weekend. Uh, for anybody listening, that's the Xenos Petting Zoo um, yeah. team. So. Yeah, so yeah, I played four of their team over the weekend. Alex was their Death Guard player. Um, we played Scorched Earth, so pretty good mission. And his list was good. Very catered for um, the meta. So he had no psychers, so he could take a ball. Mm -hmm. He had three Contemptors. Only one was the Volkite, but they all had missile launchers. And then the other two were two twin LAS cannons, which I assume is for the Orc matchup, because he has then a lot of strength, eight and nine minus three d6 damage to just try and deal with trucks and then like the combo with getting exploding sixes to hit and plus one to hit from the uh, i think it's like the tallyman maybe once something gives him plus one to hit anyway yeah. and he had reroll once to wound so yeah not familiar either so <laughs> so yeah his this was very solid he has some nurglings and like one demon nurgle character i've never heard of but he was pretty scary um, but basically what happened is I got first turn, uh, kind of went aggressive. Um, so there was like a, basically it was on the Gothic ruin map. So there was like a huge ruin in the center. 
So I touched that with all my NDKs, and he kind of mispositioned a little bit. He thought the dense cover on his side was going to be enough to protect his Contemptors. But I got like line of sight with my NDKs on his Contemptors, and then I also gated my uh, Purifiers with the side cannons into his back, because Death Guard's not a big army, and this is on the uh, Dawn of War or whatever, so it's like the long yeah. deployment. So I could get into the corner, and then I basically just picked up his two last cannon contemptors on turn one, and we would we just like so this is the guy I was playing with the clock, and we kind of just stopped the clock there, and we were kind of like this is probably just game like turn uh, like after turn one, it's kind of like oh well here's like a lot of my uh, anti tank just dead. Yeah, but he played Nothing it very to do well. With your dread nice at that point. <laughs> yeah, but he played it very well. Um, it was eighty nine to seventy five, so obviously it wasn't quite as over as we both thought. Um, and he's like got a lot of points, but like I said, he couldn't really deal with my dread knights, and kind of it was just like we were just trading points because there was a lot of terrain, and he was scoring ten primary every turn, and he worked on his secondary, so like I couldn't really deny his primary for most of the game. But yeah, it was a quite tight game, but it was a fun game, and it's yeah. pretty pretty iconic too. I mean, not as much as. Uh, as you're around six, but like you know, Death yep. Knights or Grey Knights versus uh, versus the the uh, Death Guard is like you know, yeah. And again, we kind of do really well into that army as well. Since they lost their five, but feel no pain, we kind of just eat through them with mortal wounds. So mm -hmm. from like our psychic and just tighter conversions. Yeah, and words of power. <laughs> yeah right okay um so pretty tight fun game round two nothing crazy stands out nothing so. crazy but let's get into a crazy matchup so round <laughs> three you played free buddhas who was yep. was piloted by logan heath the guy that actually ended up winning that event and tabling yep. sean nadens uh eldari on turn one. <laughs> yeah, but in kind of like as to play devil's advocate, I feel like the Sean Naden list was built very poorly to deal with uh, freebooters. Okay. Yeah, he he had like none of the raid like so venoms are even squishier than raiders. He basically had no strength eight available in his list. He had like no dark lances, so he had nothing to kill buggies, and all he realistically had was. Basically, what he did was just his turn one gambit of trying to wrap something and not die. <laughs> oh, okay, I see. So, so yeah, that was like, and, and Sean only played. That was the only free boot that Sean played the whole tournament. The rest of the time, he dodged them. So, oh, interesting. So yeah, I think a lot of people are blaming free booters for being OP, but in my opinion, it it was kind of just like a bad list matchup there. It's just, it's always interesting when you hear, though, like, you know, Sean Naden t tabled turn one. I mean, hell, yeah. it's a big deal when you hear anybody gets tabled tur turn one. It was, it's, it would sell newspapers, that's for sure, you know? Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, like the you title go. you put on there. Yeah, Get exactly. some views, clickbait. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead, let's, uh, let's get into it. What mission was it? Oh, it was Vital Intelligence, Woo, which is actually... Baby. The worst mission in the game, I will say. It's a more feel bad than scouring. Because going second on that, you have almost zero chance of scoring primary. <laughs> Which is kind of what happened in our game. Um, if you watch the game, you would be like, this is a tight game. Because we both ended the game with very little on the table each. Um, but I just couldn't score primary. Um, being able to move into the middle, he got first turn. And he went obviously very aggressive. Um, I deep uh, reserved my servitors to not give up the proc. Is that thought, all you reserved? Yeah, all I reserved was uh, huh. the one unit of servitors. Uh, I just needed stuff on the board to deal damage, pretty much. I just wanted the extra smites because he had the four planes, so he had the three Daka jets, the one Waz bomb, yeah, and then the four squig buggies. So I already knew I was gonna like lose some stuff, but actually in my turn one. I pretty much only lost one unit of interceptors and maybe half the wounds on one NDK, and that's all I lost. Oh. Um, I used my 
I basically touched everything in the dents. So every NDK was touching dents, and all my strikes were pretty much either in terrain or touching terrain because the line of sight doesn't really matter because the planes can see you no matter what. And yeah. The rooker trucks don't care. They ignore line of sight, and the jets can get across and get line of sight. So, so mostly did, I just mostly you... just deployed out of like a, a range of like the scrap jets. So I just measure because they only have a thirty. <laughs> they have like a thirty-four inch range threat with their rockets. So it's just like mm. right, I'm going to be thirty-five away with these things, and basically just give them as few shots as possible. So gotcha. That's a great point. That's like just just measure everything all the time. Pre-measure all the things. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was gonna ask, what tide were, did did you just stay in shadows for like the first three turns so that you didn't? I get yeah, I didn't swept. leave shadows. I don't think I just I stayed in shadows the whole game. Um, I think that's a good play against how much shooting. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, I didn't lose anything important turn one. Um, but he, like I said, he got first turn, rushed everything out into the middle, and he had the commandos there already. So of course. He basically he basically controlled five objectives turn one. Woo. Uh, my turn one, I killed the Waz bomb, two Jacker jets. Um, I think I killed one of his scrap jets and maybe something else. So I picked up way more turn one, mm -hmm. but I couldn't play too aggressive. Like anything I put out would die. So I did move out onto two objectives with some interceptors. Um, but they died, so I, I could just never get primary, which is, like, all my points came from secondaries. I did not score a single primary point, Oof. which is why the game looks so one-sided. Because it was, it was a thirty-three to a ninety-eight, which sounds terrible. But like yeah. I said, if you would watch the game and you look at the models left on the table, it was much closer. Yep. Um, the one thing I think I could have done different is there was definitely so I, how I had my terrain set up. I could have had dents slightly closer to the middle objectives and then touch the dents and like angled the NDK bases because they're so long to touch the objective as well with the obsec aura. Mm -hmm. So they could probably withstand like a turn of shooting on there. So I could have done that probably to score some primary. But uh, yeah, it was it was like a tough game. For um, people listening. Um... Remember, Vital Intel is a hold two, hold three, hold more, not a hold one, hold two. So, um, yeah. even though everybody has one um, in their backfield, uh, in their deployment zone, you still have to go out there into the middle where the other four are and fight for them. So, yeah. Um, and and the, they're. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, no, you can keep going. Sorry, I was just gonna bring add something else in a second. Oh, I was just gonna also remind everybody, and I'll throw up a uh, a map like photo um, for this or uh, for every matchup, um, actually. But each pair of extra um, uh, objectives uh, in the middle are off center, so there are four in the middle in a straight line, and then uh, one in each. The deployment zone, but there's not one like right in the center, so it's a little crazy. And then there's only 24 inches between each deployment zone, so you can, you know, get you can get within uh weapon and melee range very very quickly. Yep, and then also the other thing is, as a lot of people forget, is that. So if you hold the objective at the start of your command phase, you could then move off the objective and still count as holding it. So you kind of like, oh, that's right. You kind of flip the objectives on. So that makes basically if you go second on that, it is a bad time. Mm. <laughs> and that's why I feel it's just like the worst mission. It's like the one where I feel the the role to go first is like the most important role. Because generally, I prefer going second, and this is like the only mission I don't like going second on. Yeah, I actually agree with you. For the most part, I don't mind going on second with either of the two armies that I play, generally. Um, there are definitely some where, like, you know, maybe maybe they've deployed really aggressively, and um, I've counter-deployed, and I really want to, you know, punch them right in the face turn one, um, but 
That's about yeah. the only time that I want. Otherwise, I'm like hiding everything and stuff's in deep strike. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to not get shot off the board turn one. Yeah, generally speaking, the the way well the way I play Gary Knights and the way Nick probably plays it too is like you just want to put pressure on your opponent to do something. That's why I like having second because you threaten that 15 on the the last turn, and you can kind of just sit back and your opponent can also sit back, but you're going, okay, I'm going to score my three strangle, I'm going to score four for ritual, I'm going to get my two banners. And your opponent's just sat there going, oh, he's scoring, he's going to max primaries, he's getting his 10 every turn, and then he can threaten 15 on the last turn. So it kind of puts like an emphasis on your opponent to have to make something happen. And then once they try and make something happen, that's usually where Grey Knights can really capitalize, because we have the 12-inch move interceptor, so you can get an easy charge off, and then yeah. you can gate into a good position or you know there's you they get into smite range at that point as well and then you're basically doing smite damage shooting damage charge damage and that's when you're really ramping up so that's kind of like the main thing i like about gray knights currently is that you put a lot of pressure on your opponent to try and make things happen yeah we aren't quite dark angels where we'll score 95 without leaving our deployment zone but um we definitely put the onus on with though especially with the uh you know those three secondaries right like yep. you really put the onus on your opponent to come stop you from scoring very highly uh <laughs> you don't have to move onto their side of the board if you don't want to so yeah so All yeah right. that was like a that was like a rough one to end the day on um but I, we'd already worked it out that you could basically make top eight with a five one, so I wasn't like super discouraged. I was like, mm -hmm. "It is what it is." Obviously, in the end, that ends up biting me in the ass because I needed, I basically needed points. fifteen more points. Yeah, but if I could have just got primary two <laughs> times, it would have pushed me in there. But it yeah. is what it is. Um, but yeah, Man. also another XPZ guy. So that's two I face now, and I'm one and one against them. So, yeah. all right. So how was that night? You guys go out and. Get hammered, or I actually slept terribly safe. the first night. Um, mm. so I kind of got back and was just almost instantly asleep. I think <laughs> we uh we put like mummy returns on in the Airbnb, but nice. I was like I was out so quick. I I just like didn't sleep at all the first night. All right, well, so I guess you slept well that night at least. <laughs> Yeah, I slept amazing that night. This, the, I went in so fresh day two, which is probably why I did so well day two. <laughs> One of them, but like you must have gotten this big old slap in the face that your first match. So you got uh, you got paired against Admech with the three Stratocopter and one Fuchsia Lage. Or, uh, is it, how do yep. you even pronounce that? Fuchsia? Yeah, I got it right. Fuchsia Lage. Fuchsia yep. Lage. So <laughs> yep. four flyers, four Admech flyers right out the right out the gate but you you pulled out a win 99 to 46 so how did that go so his list was basically the standard admin list which is the four last cannon flyers the bomber then he had the two ranger bricks uh a big block of 10 rust stalkers some infiltrators, some hounds, and then like a couple of MSUs. So his list was very standard ad mech, and I hadn't really played it on the table yet. So didn't really know how it was going to go, but um, we played Surround and Destroy, which was another uh, Dawn of War deployment. And I got first turn, which kind of helped. Um, I didn't really do any damage turn one. Um, I started in um, what is it convergence because so one thing is like a lot of people forget is that you can flies don't get the benefit of cover so you can actually stand behind lost blocking terrain as long as there's like windows on the second floor or whatever you can still shoot the flyers without exposing yourself so okay I stood all my NDKs within thirty inches of his flyers and then didn't expose them to the ranger bricks. And then, but he's, but uh, Admech have like the advantage because he was playing like the Sakari cohort thing where the the flyers can get their um all the buffs. So he did the shroud song and he did the 
uh, the Bulwark protocol. So basically, it's Flyer's yeah. roll plus plus two save. The T seven for some reason minus yeah. one to hit. I have no so... idea why those little flappy things are T seven. <laughs> like they yep. look like they should be like T four. <laughs> They're like little fabric wings and stuff. Yep. So I had the my I thought fat great got turn one. Kill two flies. Um, so I set myself up to amplification one with my uh, grandmaster because I shunted him forward uh, on like the opposite side of his rustalker. So he had like no combat to come deal with me. So it's kind of like a general strategy I do with my GK, like uh, like the, with the sigil. I'll like throw him up on the side where there's like no combat, and yeah. they shoot him and he'll teleport away or they kind of just leave him there. That's a great. That's a great idea. <laughs> Or the other thing that you can do is you, if there's a melee unit on that side that's like, if you can use the three up invul and you'll probably survive it, you can also just like kind of bait that out, survive with the three up invul and then kind of like kill it on the strike back, I guess. Yeah. So and the three up invul does last like through the whole turn. Uh, yeah, he's like so... my favorite unit. He's so tricksy. It's great. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I killed not not I basically killed nothing turn one. Um and I was a little worried. Uh but because he didn't get to start, he had he obviously had the defensive uh all his defensive buffs up mm -hmm. instead of like the two plus ballistic skill and like reroll two hits and wound thing. So his a... Wait, so you said Shroud Psalm, so he was Mars, right? Yep. And then Mars also per unit. It's to reroll one hit, or is it one hit and yeah. one wound? So he gets to reroll one hit with Mars, but then there's like another protocol. I think it's like this. Basically, it's like Iron Bulwarks, a, the Iron whatever Bulwarks a protocol. There's like another protocol that lets you reroll another hit. Oh wow! And, it, and lets you reroll a wound and a damage. I think so. Basically, oh, they, crap. that's kind, that's kind of like the combo they want to. If they get first, they'll do that to have the the two plus to hit. The re-rolling two hit rolls, the re-rolling wound roll, re-rolling a damage roll, and it can be very scary. On on so, the D three plus three lasers. Yep. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, into into us specifically, it's not as bad because they they don't have the quantity of shots. Three flies is still only going to be the six uh, last cannons. So even if they hit and wound with all three, all six, sorry. We're still going to save three of those on average because they're going to be targeting NDKs. Mm -hmm. So realistically, at worst, they only kill one NDK with all their flies. Yeah. But uh, because he started in defensive stuff, he flew all his flies across. Um, I don't think he did a single wound to my NDKs. Um, I was standing on the dents, so he's hitting on fours. He had the one re-roll, so he's only hit like hitting fifty percent of the time, and then wounding like on a three up. So he like missed. He missed like probably half. And I made up. I made two four up saves, so I didn't take any damage really on my turn one, and he just kind of got in position. Um, and then from there, it was kind of like just a very similar rinse and repeat, where it was I smited like two planes out of the sky because I chipped away at two, <laughs> the two I shot at, but I didn't kill them. So then, purifying purifying flames plus vortex plus smites took two two of the wounded flies out of the sky. I then shot the other two out of the sky. So I pretty much killed all his planes turn one. Well, my turn two, sorry. Yeah. That's a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. So I was pretty healthy um, on the board after that. And then kind of it just snowballed from there where he they, he didn't really have the firepower. And I just avoided his range of bricks mostly. Um he pushed out, and then in his turn two, we had to push out with a ranger brick to try and take a mill objective, and then I kind of just shot all three NDKs at it and just killed it. And then, yeah, it just kind of just snowballed from, like, a bad turn one, I guess. And again, and he was an XPZ guy. Uh, everyone I played from their team was great opponent, like, very friendly. But, yeah, this one just kind of went downhill real fast <laughs> yeah that that is one of the things that i'm a little apprehensive about with this rtt is i've never gone into the portland meta at all and um i'm i'm always i have some trepidation about running uh uh into like a, a douchebag <laughs> <laughs> i I uh, I'm a pretty happy go looking like like run off my back 
kind of guy, but uh, you know, you're if if you're playing a game with somebody for three hours, you really hope that they're not gonna be a prick, yeah. right? So yeah, I, everyone I played was pretty good. Uh, uh, my next opponent was like the worst opponent I played, but we were kind of getting towards that where it's like, folks are like, tired. We're, we're, well, round five, and we're all sitting. We're we're kind of sitting on like three and one, and you can make it in with a five and one. So he wasn't like a bad opponent. He just kind of like nickel and dime me a lot. Mm. It was like, are you, are you sure this is within three kind of thing? Uh, I forgot to move my grandmaster after a sigil. Like I did like one psychic spell, and I was like, oh, do, can I move this? And he was like, no, we're in psychic phase kind of thing. Where it's like normally like. I'll give everyone one. It's like you, you know, you move this to do this, and I can I play a lot by intent. So yeah, obviously if someone tells me like I'm doing this to do this in like two turns, or whatever, or I'm gonna use the stratagem. And as long as I know that's what they were gonna do, I'm not like nope, we're out of that phase. No takesy backsies kind of thing. Yeah, but, that's the way my my friends and I play too. Um, but yeah, I guess my like one... <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that's like yeah, just one thing at tournaments. It's kind of like kind of expect everyone to play like your friends and like. A... If you are trying to get into that top spot, everyone's obviously going to play for every advantage. But no, my my uh, my goal is to not be last. Yeah, <laughs> everyone wants to win. So yeah, but, yeah. but like this is my first tournament, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm not into the habit of like list submission and how does the process work once I get there? And, um, you know, I don't even really have a good way to transport my army yet. So I've got all these disadvantages already that have nothing to do with the actual game. Right. Well, look, yeah. Luckily, <laughs> nowadays, BCP does 90% of the work. So you just submit on there. You don't even need to bring paper lists anymore, and you don't need to check in. Like, you just check in on the app. So it's oh, like, okay. 90% of the hard stuff is kind of done now automatically. Um, transporting is another question. Yeah. I use like a ghetto rigged. Um, so I have magnets in all my bases. And then I've kind of just taken like a, like a shed sheet metal and then lined the bottom of like a box with it. That, so all my models just like stick to that. That is 100% what I'm planning on having done is once I'm done painting and basing these last four models, I have already bought a plastic tub. I'm gonna buy a thing of sheet metal and I'm just gonna magnetize all the bottom of my bases. I have plenty of yeah. magnets. I magnetize almost all my models anyway, so it's not yeah. a big deal for me, so. So yeah, I use Squad Marks, shameless plug. Um, they're <laughs> like, uh, basically just ways to tell you different units apart but also they have magnets on the bottom already so you can kind oh, of just cool. put them onto your base and then do that but nice. yeah mason's like a good buddy of mine and he runs mm -hmm. squad marks so squad marks great there you yep. go free sponsorship yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right but well yeah. so admac was pretty decent uh you got a little lucky the the, the terrain helped and then like once once the flyers were out of the sky, things went went much better. Yeah, um, and I was I like I said, I hadn't played that mech matchup, so I was a little worried about how it would go, but I think that we actually have a decent ad mech matchup. I don't think it's bad. Especially with play place terrain, because it definitely gives you enough places to hide. Yeah. Sure. Um yeah, man, terrain is that silent third player, and it can just completely fuck you, or it can be like <laughs> like your absolute savior, you know? Like yeah, and th and that's definitely why I like the play place terrain because you can't go into a board and be like terrain. Fu you can't be like you can't use it as an excuse where it's like <laughs> bad terrain. Played plant bowling ball, there was nothing I could do. Yeah, it's like if you have if the terrain is bad, it's because you deploy it, like you set it up bad. And that's a really good point. And sure, it adds like another skill check, but I think if you're going to a tournament at, like at this point, then you should already like it's the same as secondaries, right? If you're going to a major, but um, and I'm glad you brought that up. And for my uh, listeners who listen to like every one of these, you know, they're they're gonna roll their eyes here, but like I love the fact that there's so many little metas inside of the meta, like. I know what drives people away from this game is it's so complicated, but what interests me in this game is that it's so complicated, right? Like, yeah, 
you got to know what's you, like before you even put a model on the table when you do your list building you have to be aware of like you know have tools to deal with certain matchups you have to already have an idea of what secondaries that you, that you want right like also what secondaries you <clears> deny <throat> because you can build that's like probably the best thing about gray knights is like other than a boar we don't really give up no prisoners we don't give up bring it down like we're very hard to score again. Like a lot of lists are only taking three characters, so we're gonna give up nine assassinate. Yeah, that's a good so. point. Yeah, so nine assassinate. Even if you bring five and DKs, you're only doing ten for bring it down, which makes it a decent choice, but not an auto pick. Because yeah, they're not easy to kill, so it's not and no guarantee you kill all five. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and after playing like the LV team tournament, the Las Vegas team tournament, um. Which is play place terrain plus the meta of like yeah that's another layer <laughs> like another I, I love it it's like an onion so like you've got your matchups that you have to think about then you have to think about what table you're gonna go on then you've got to do your it's it's a yeah. lot of fun that's... adds like a lot a lot more intricacy but all those little things like add up to like a very fun experience yeah one of the things that Denise says is that like. Solo tournament is um, like an introduction to competitive, and then teams is like the real deal, just because there is so much more that goes in to that, right? Like, you might yeah. have one player who brings a tilt list, and you bring a, a, a meta list, and you're purposefully trying to like, or a list completely skewed to like take out that admech flyer list, and you're trying to pair in, pair yeah. into that matchup, and it's like There's fascinating. Definitely a lot of room, a lot of room for skew, and like weird lists like knights can do exceptionally well in that kind of situation because some lists just can't kill knights. Like Sean Naden's list, for example. Could not kill a knight. All he had was basically strength five, damage one combat, which would pretty much bounce off a knight, and then he gets tabled equally as bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, it opens up a lot of options, and even then, it's kind of like the niche relics kind of become more relevant. Yeah. So, for instance, like the sisters litany to ignore psychic or whatever, you might be like you build your sisters to be more anti gray knights, and then you try and put sisters against gray knights, and then. But yeah, it's a lot of, I, I like the team tournaments probably the best now. Very cool. I will get there eventually. I definitely want to try one out at uh at uh at, at least one. Yep. So you're round five here, orcs free Buddhas again. Um, yep. I think it, when I did my research, it looked like this list leaned heavily into Daka jets and buggies way more than um Logan's list did. So it had the same amount of flyers. It was just three Daka jets and the Waz bomb, but it had it was more uh, buggy heavy. So I think he had a big unit of three scrap jets, and then maybe a two units of three scrap jets, and then four Rooker trucks, squig buggies, and then yeah, he didn't have the mech guns and stuff. So yeah, it was like a little different, but it basically had that core of four planes, four squig buggies, some amount of <laughs> scrap jets. Yeah, but okay. um, we got battle lines, which is not another great mission, but long deployment, which helped. Um, I got, I got second turn again, so I wasn't feeling amazing, but kind of the same thing happened where I reserved my servitors, and I touched dense with everything. Like just touching dense is so important, <laughs> and then. Then just using your transhuman, like he shoots, like as soon as like the rooker trucks pick something to shoot at, you just go okay, transhuman. You just need to deny that first proc for as long as possible, and then it helps a lot against like the damage output. Yeah, I mean, it still um, is it still is orc shooting. So it, the longest, yeah. the longer you can keep them down at that orc like level and not. Uh, allow them to to become space marines. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, just touching dense is is mostly what you need, and then obviously just tie to shadows. You even against minus three, your marines are still gonna have like their five up. So 
Yeah, which isn't too terrible, for sure. It, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, and this but, is probably where the warding stave could potentially come in very handy if they're, like, you know, if in that weird event where you don't have enough terrain and you didn't uh, stick them in to deep strike or something, you could at yeah. least pop the one CP five up in both strat. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of again, the planes came in, and again, Purify is doing the, doing the best. Just picked up two planes with my first Psychic phase. Well, like one and a half. So, doing 12 damage to one is like pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, is that then, how many wounds they have? Yeah, they have 12. 12 on the Daka Jets. Okay. And then Amplified the Waz Bomber, and my unit of Purify is just picked that up killed that like straight up oh with the uh the side cannons yeah so they were doing flat three i made i obviously made them strength eight minus two yeah so i only had to get like <laughs> like four through to kill it yeah so rude <laughs> i yeah. love it so after killing all his planes um Kind of again, it's kind of like one of those matchups where, like as I mentioned earlier, I used like the magic box on one of the objectives. Mm -hmm. So I took stranglehold on a four objective, which he was kind of like, "You want to do stranglehold?" And I was like, "Yeah, it'd probably probably be fine." And this was battle lines, just yeah, to reiterate, four, yeah, to reiterate, yep, yeah, yeah, four objectives. But I <laughs> set up two L because like the player plays terrain again. It's like I set up two Ls, kind of like within 12 of the two center objectives and then set up like two majority of my, like my split my force. And then I can kind of easily get onto these middle objectives. And because one's got a magic box on it already, I can kind of just hide in one. And I only really need to push out onto the other one. And freeboot is kind of like lack obsec. So with the chaplain given obsec to interceptors, you can kind of string back a little bit. Yeah. So you only really need point. to touch it with one model. And then you have like, two models hidden behind the L and then you have like three exposed. So generally speaking, you're only really going to lose like two or three models, like increments from like an orc shooting phase, like per unit. Yeah. So if you lose the first three, then the two behind the L will generally survive. And the next turn you can just throw like two guys onto the objective. Yeah. I mean, even Which that is... last one can still get you purifying ritual, right? Like, yep. And stranglehold. So, so. Yeah. And so generally, that's that's where the chaplain leadership really came in clutch like a lot of times where it's like I'd have one or two guys left and then don't have to worry about that morale and then yeah. I just throw like a two I just throw away two men after that. Yeah, that's that's true. With leadership nine, if you lose three guys, you just still don't have to roll. <laughs> yep. Nice. Um man, purifying ritual, like the fact that you don't have to control the it's objective super strong. is so good. Like it's so good, just nuts how good that I, is. My counter argument is, is that they get a bore the witch, which it's is true. giving which is giving too many points. So yeah, we both we both get like an auto fifteen, and that to me sounds fair. Yeah, I <laughs> I agree one hundred percent. Um, like abhor felt so bad to play like Admech, Jakari, you know, orcs don't even really, they can take a Psyker if they want, but most don't. So like already against those, those three, you're already down 15 points to start. Yeah, so. pretty much. And then Sisters also very good right now. And then yep. what's the order that gets five up just straight up denies? Oh yeah. Well, they can the pick. It's like about, it's a battle, right? So they Oh, can okay. Yeah, so any order can take it, and then they just pick it. It's kind of like the Black Templar vows are now. So it's yeah. like a pre, it's like a, a first turn decision you make. So uh, well, that must be nice. It's, it's very <laughs> annoying. <laughs> but yeah, so I beat that free boost play eighty five to sixty five. Um, and again, it was kind of just like a bit autopilot after killing the flyers. But it was it was still a little interesting, but. Yeah, I mean, so so like the squig buggies, right? They do two damage. So if they're firing into your purifiers, you can pop the minus one damage strat, yeah. which just like takes the um the wind out of them so fast. Yeah, um, and outside then outside of the speed war, they're only AP two. So if you're in tight of shadows, you're getting a four up against them, 
and then if you're half dead, it's basically you half the amount you take with the saves, and then half the amount with the maximum damage. So. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And then if you're also in terrain, like it, like in a crater, you're gonna yeah, be minus off, minus fives, one to yeah. hit too. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. So. So let's get into your last matchup, round six. You played against the disciples of Bellacor. Yep, I played Hayden from XPZ. So he was also a great opponent, and he was obviously doing well with. It was weird because demons got into the top eight, and then there was also this guy who was in position to do well because he was on a a four one currently. Ooh. We were both four one going into round six. You are um, not. Kidding. Like Chaos Demons made it into top eight. Wow. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Um and then yeah, like I said, this guy could have also made it top eight. Um if he didn't run into Grey Knights. <laughs> <laughs> so this was kind of uh so I took the secondary the demon specific one where you kill a demon unit, you just get a point. Killing like a demon prince gives you three points, and then I think killing a Primarch gives you five. And then monsters give you two? Something like that. But yeah, basically it's it's a board the witch but for killing demons. Right. And it's it's kinda like if you uh any of my Death Watch uh listeners out there, it's like um the uh Xenos killing Death Watch specific one that I can't remember the name of right now. Um so yeah, I took this one as my Grey Knight one instead of Ritual because he did have a Sorcerer, a Changecaster, he had Bellacore, so he had like a, f a few denies. And we're playing Scouring, so it's all kind of in the middle. So I was a Ugh. little worried. Um, again, he didn't have like enough denies to deny me, but I did want to use a, a lot of Smites to like pick up Demons because he has no Feel No Pain. So. And they're all one wound, and they're basically relying on invulns, So. Oh yeah. So I, if you just I, I get knew... right past that, it's yeah. You know. So I wanted to do a lot of smites, so I was just like, I'll take this one. Um, and then I did. I think I just did strangle again, and I did. I think I did rod. Rod was the last one I did on this one. Because we yeah everyone wanted, we need to get everything in the middle, so I was like. Planning on like game, you can spend the two CP to shun some interceptors to get Rod, or yeah. basically forcing him to stay back a bit. He took weirdly the mission specific one, which was probably his strategic his scan. <laughs> yeah, well, he had a big unit of thirty um, pink horrors, okay. and with the with the special like disciple of Bellicor stuff, you can. They're basically if they're within range of a. Psycho, the uh, one of the characters, they're minus one to hit. So all this stuff is basically minus one to hit. And if they're within six inches of Bellacore, you can't re-roll hit rolls. Ooh. So trying to kill a thirty-man blob with which you're hitting on fours, no re-rolls. They got a four pin vuln on the pink horrors anyway. Yeah. It's like it's like pretty tough. So I assume I, he must have just thought he could survive on each objective and just get this off. So okay. That's and then fair. his other. His other object, he took Rod as well, because he had two units of Furies that he could deep strike. And he had some cultists. Um, and then his last one. Hmm. With Strangle as well, I think. So yeah, he did Strangle Rod and then the mission specific. But, um. He rolled real bad saves, mostly, <laughs> which is kind of why this was a 94 to 29. That uh, thirty-man blob just got disintegrated by three NDKs, pretty much, which was a big thing. Um, and I don't know if he forgot about the demon-specific strat for Grey Knights, or if he wasn't using it to deny me points, but he never used the two CP bring back a demon unit that's been killed by a Grey Knight. Does, I thought I thought that it was ruled that any of those still count. So that he would just be giving you more point. I mean, br like bringing back that thirty man unit would have been yeah. huge, regardless. But like, yeah, um, he only started on five CP. So and then he spent two or three in his first turn. So he didn't have a lot of CP. Oh, I see. Yeah. And you can't bring back name characters, so he couldn't bring back like Bellacor, for instance, because he had Bellacor. Right. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know if he just forgot about it because it's just kind of one of those niche strats that don't come up often. But he was a good player, so yeah, yeah. And like I said, we were both playing for that five-one position, so I wasn't in a very charitable mood where I'd remind him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I, I don't know. Uh, could be a little scummy, but I'm like, eh, I'm not. I'm not like cheating or anything. I'm just not like it. It's not my job to tell every player all their rules, so. <laughs> It's kind enough. of how, it's, but yeah, like I said, we, it was like round six, so yeah. Um, but now you're tired too. Like you're into your 18th hour of playing 40k over two days. Oh yeah, everyone's <laughs> like, like kind of, yeah, every, everyone's like, frazzled game six. Everyone yeah. just wants to be be done and go home kind That's of thing. Exactly the 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 word I was gonna use is frazzled. Like you got to be like twitching by that point. <laughs> yeah. But then if then if you did good, then you had to play a day three, so <laughs> Woo. Well So this was just yeah. Yeah. So you knocked yeah, it... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, good. I was just gonna say, yeah, it was a good game. Uh great opponent. Um he just like had bad roles and Yeah, just Grey Knights just I mean, Grey Knights just do things in the demon. Like every gun we have is great against them because we don't have AP but all they have is invulns. And they're all T three, like on the blood letters and the pinks, so yeah. Um, is it the pinks that split into blues, or is it the other way? It's pinks that can split into blues into brims, but you have to pay reserve points now. Ah. Uh, so, so no, no one pays the reserve points, okay. pretty much. All some right, people uh, might keep a few, because you can do some shenanigans where, like, if a pink dies, you can then deploy, like, blue, like string forward a little bit. Of, yeah. Like, some blues. Like the old uh, Space Marine Apothecary uh, jank you can do, where, like, you 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 respawn the model like right on an yeah, objective just or closer. something. Yeah, yeah, you just get closer. So yeah, but yeah, but and he was another XPZ guy. So I played four of them total, beat three, lost to Logan. So all right, well hell, um, tell me so tell me about Bell Bellacor then. So like I, I when that book hit. Um, there was a lot of chatter for about two weeks, and then silence. Um, <laughs> he was kind of, he was kind of like the new Morty. Everyone was like, Mortarian is unkillable, and yeah. then people were like, "Oh, actually, he just dies to laser chickens and dark land spam." Yeah. Well, at the time, that wasn't uh, when Morty came out. That wasn't a thing because yeah, it Adnet wasn't a thing. Yeah. Yeah. didn't have their book yet. But yeah, it, um, I remember all that too. Um, the Warhammer competitive subreddit was really interesting during the whole Morty phase uh, because, like, a few guys on there that were playing TTS a lot are like, no, guys, I'm telling you, this problem is already solved. We've already <laughs> figured out how we can kill Morty. We've already run dozens of games killing Morty. Like, it's fine, believe me. And, and like, peeps are like, I don't believe you. <laughs> like this is gonna be a scourge. Like Death Guard is gonna win all the time. All you have to do is is bring Morty. And now, like, I mean, yeah, he's super good, <laughs> but he's also four hundred ninety points. <laughs> yeah, and I played Grey Knights in that time as well, and I was like, flat four smites kind of just kill Morty. So yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it didn't have scaling smite cost back then. So yeah, just smite your whole army at him. That's true. But yeah. But Bellacor was like the next Mortarion, where everyone was like, he is going to be unkillable. Because he just had the advantage of being only 16 wounds, so you, he is obscurable. Um, can't and, rerolls to hit him, and he is minus one to wounds, so... Yeah, I mean, which is all a great stat block, but the things that I was hearing about is because he has, like, every um, Chaos uh, God's keyword that you can, like, you could do some absolutely ridiculous stuff with um, command points, like with stratagems, right? Like, because you could give them like a Zeet strat and a Nurgle strat or whatever. I, I don't play Chaos, so I don't know a lot of the specifics, but it's like seemed pretty interesting what you could do based on that. I think he only really has access to like the the fight twice which is the corn one and then like maybe the heal d3 like he doesn't have a lot because uh he can't be like exalted because he's a name character i think like a lot of them are like excluded from him but 
And like his other main issue is that all he really has to fight as a save is like his is inborn, like his, which is a four up. So any shots that like get through, chip him away. Yeah. And he like so our his Bellacore fought my GMDK and a unit of strikes. He killed my unit. Of, he killed my GMDK, but then five strikes did fourteen damage to him. I think. Wow. Just, just fighting him. Uh, <laughs> they were rapists, so I used the exploding sixes, and then just like the that plus convergent. He has like no feel, no pain, so the mortal wounds went straight through, and then he died to two smites. So after that, yeah. So it was kind of like very anticlimactic. And <laughs> <laughs> go back in the war. Like, I, mean, I mean, he killed my GMDK. Like I couldn't take. You can't take invulns against him, which is scary. I did not know that, and that was very scary. I was like three up invuln, I'm fine. And he's like, can't take invulns. I was like, oh shit, minus four. Okay, I got six up. Yeah. Oh, oh god, five hits just went through. Okay, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. I mean, if you bring that demon slayer warlord trait, though, he doesn't get he his invulns either. Yeah, that's big true. Yeah. Um, maybe and, if demons become the new meta, then maybe it'd be worth it. Like, has very niche application. Like, against yeah. Death Guard, it's not too bad. Against Thousand Sons, it could be interesting. But I don't take it for that. I take it because an extra Plus attack, attack is super is good. Also good. Yeah. yeah. Basically gives them back um, uh, Shock Assault, which yeah. we lost, obviously, when the Codex came out so i i don't know i i can't i long for the day that i can remind an opponent that you know like their plague burst crawler doesn't get the five up <laughs> yeah. i'm just going to smash it into the ground now <laughs> yeah it's pretty it'll be pretty like I said, it is good um i just mm -hmm. find myself not having enough all the traits because you yeah. gotta take on yielding anvil you want to take divination you want to do one at least one on him so it's kind of like very stretched for warlord traits yeah my uh my rtt list only has six command points so you know my new list is only six so yeah which is i don't know if it's going to replace this list it's just something i'm going to try out but it's uh it's well, more dudes <laughs> Nice. Well, that's what the RTT is for, right? Like you can, yeah, you can go there testing. and try out some new lists against armies that you normally wouldn't see, and yeah, that's that is super super cool. So, um, speaking of RTTs, do you have any more advice for a new tournament player? Um. Like I've been told, you know, make sure to get good sleep and drink lots of water and you know all that jazz, which is is fine. Like that makes. I mean, that's that makes a, sense. A, a surviving, right? It's like yeah, a, it's true. Don't die, don't die or something. It's like <laughs> it's the same uh, advice for like, hey, you're going in for a job interview, you know, like stay yeah. hydrated and uh, uh, sleep well if the <laughs> the night before. I think yeah, I think, like, like I said, the main thing is just make sure there's no weird tournament rules. Um, like I said, there's sometimes, like FLG, for instance, they have weird tags on their terrain. So just make sure you're not going to get caught out by something weird like that. Um, just make sure you've got your codex. Um, phone full battery is like probably the most important <laughs> thing. That you was... need to have that what. Wahapedia just needs to be up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was actually one of the uh, uh, other pieces of advice that someone gave me. Is like, nah, like phone at one hundred percent. So, yeah, because you do need to be on Wahapedia. Because a lot of people either misremember, like you're on game three or whatever, you misremember a rule, and it's always good just to double check. Sometimes, yeah. if something sounds too good, it's usually it is too good, and it's that like, makes sense. You don't want to like shortchange yourself, and you don't want to get shortchanged. Like you don't want to walk away from, at the end of the game feeling like, oh, this rule got played wrong, and then we remember too late, and then it's like, oh, now it still feels bad. Where? Yeah. Well, it's like, um, you know, I I travel a decent amount. Um, like three days after this RTT, I'm uh, I'm gonna be in Scotland, so I have quite a few, um, you know, battery charger bricks. 
I was yeah. probably going to drop one in my back pocket and then just like as soon as my phone is on half, just leave it plugged in. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. And then, and then, yeah, like I said, uh, probably like the other thing we've already covered is just know what secondary, like look at the missions as well. You want to sort of go in with like an idea of what mission, like secondaries you want to do hmm. because your t- time at the start, you feel like a little rushed and sometimes picking the wrong secondary is like, You've already lost the game before you start, so Good advice. you want to be like, you want to be like, yeah, I'm gonna do like these three, and then if I'm against orcs, I can swap this one out for bring it down, or and that's kind of generally what I do. I'll normally like look at the missions. Um, if it's like priority targets, I'll go, okay, I'm definitely doing strangle priority targets ritual sorted. Don't need to think about that. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and I've brought this up. Uh before but uh for 17 dollars unlimited tacos for the whole time that i'm there just saying <laughs> pretty pretty sweet yeah man oh i'm super into probably that like, probably like one other piece of advice i'd give is just don't be afraid to ask questions people want to tell you about their army so just be like what's the threat range on this okay so it can move 10 can it advance and charge no okay so if i'm 22.1 inches away you can't charge me and then you both agree and then just make sure you've both agreed to this and then you yeah. set it up and then just be very um uh, like play everything with like the intent and just let your intent be no don't like be you don't want to be like a mute at the table you're playing like someone else so it's always yeah. good just to be like this is my intent okay i'm gonna be an inch from this wall so you can't charge me through this wall without going around or yeah, I I, yeah. I try to do that with my friends anyway i find that it's actually super helpful to say it out loud to remind yourself anyway so even if you're playing you know like some world-class player i would still be saying that stuff regardless just so that i am like talking through it to myself um i don't know what your pro profession is but i'm a software engineer and there is a technique called rubber ducking where you just talk to and the uh a the example always given is you like talk out a problem to a rubber duck like okay. on your desk and it's not that the duck is obviously going to give you any advice but like simply walking through and talking through what you're doing and why you're doing it can help you find flaws um in your own logic yeah where like makes, usually makes yeah like our brains go so fast or at least mine does like i'm like i'm thinking of like 30 things at the exact same time um and sometimes that means that i'm gonna miss or forget details but if you like say it out loud and you slow down um that helps me anyway so definitely true yeah and then yeah that's probably like another good thing is just take especially like your first movement phase just take it very slow like because that's very the movement phase is like the most important phase because yeah. pretty much no dice rolls involved and you have full control over where you're going to end up and you want to be thinking like the, a turn ahead. And sometimes people feel like, especially if it's like a chess clock, you feel like a little rushed, but yeah, just take your time with like the movement and make sure like everything's correct. <laughs> gotcha. All right, man. Well, um, it's been very nearly t- two hours. Um, thank you you very much for taking all the time you've got an interesting list you did very very well at that crazy major um it's awesome to see the green knights you know punching face um after being underdogs after ninth released so yep feels great right playing gray knights now like i said i feel like after the next uh mfm we're probably going to be top one or two armies well which again will be like a different problem because then we get teched against and then we're in the spotlight for nerf (laughs) so we'll see how the the one six months after that is (laughs) yeah we'll see and then also new codexes coming out right like um you know that warzone uh carry stuff for nids <laughs> it's gonna be a good boost i don't think it's yeah. gonna do anything for god but nids got a few scary combos 
But um, it does, it gives us a little bit of insight into what the codexes might look like, too. So, like, that's a nice little boost for guard, even though it won't be enough to, like, make them, you know, top table. But, um, you know. I just wish they put secondary. I feel like that's the, the biggest thing between top armies and bottom armies is secondaries. Yeah. And I wish they had just released secondaries for every army, like, at the same time. So yeah. then we'd have, like, a. Cause, that is like probably yeah the biggest uh, just like disparity I guess is is secondary because as soon as Grey Knights got ritual we're like okay now we can do this every <laughs> every yeah, turn exactly that's true so like you were saying like if if we had our eighth edition codex we got the extra wound and purifying ritual you know <laughs> I would have been completely happy because I used to I loved that codex it was great. Except well, for the D three damage on most of the weapons, that that was obnoxious. Oh yeah, and I hate it. Was it. A little, it was a little, <laughs> little, little, little feels bad when you're ten paladins kind of bounce off stuff. Yeah, but all right, man. But yeah, well, um, thank you again, uh, very, very, uh, very much. Um, I just want to remind all of my viewers, again, like and comment and subscribe and share and all of that. Um, we have a very active Grey Knights Discord community, which is where I actually found Matthew. Um, <laughs> so um, there's links in the description below. Uh, climb on in and, and talk Grey Knights. Um, and don't forget to, uh, to call your mother.